Hello, good morning. Today, our guest is Professor George Tridimas. Hello, Professor. How are you doing? Just call me George to begin with. All right, George. Second, second uh, it's Tree Dimas. It's a oh, great sorry. name. Sorry, sorry. That's okay, that's okay. It, I, I, I don't mind that. What I do mind is that uh, sometimes people actually misspell it as Tri Midas. And I'm not a Midas. No. <laughs> if I were a Midas. <laughs> With all that gold, I don't, I don't know where I would have been. It's three demons. And funnily enough, it appears to be uh, something like uh, three demons, meaning three different districts. So probably one of the great, great grandparents was combining uh, three different kind of um, uh, origins or something like that. So he became a, a person from three different districts. All right, Professor George. So <laughs> I, George. yes, Please, George, George, yes, I'm, I'm a bit formal. So George, I have been paying attention to Greek economic history for some time. And a few years ago, I stumbled upon your work out of curiosity. And then I decided to read a paper published by the Cambridge Journal of Institutional Economics called The Failure of Asian Greek Growth, Institutions, Culture, and Energy Costs. It's quite fascinating. And I'm going to begin by starting to ask questions. George, did ancient Greece record economic growth? And you're dealing with the period 800 to 300 BCE. Yes, that period is a period which, from all the evidence that we have, was uh, uh, a period of growth, a period of prosperity, and historians have come to call it the period of Greek efflorescence. We and, uh, don't have actually much by way of quantitative uh, information. Uh, part of the reason was uh, or is that uh, the Greeks did not like to record lots of information so that it would not be used by governments for any. that um, it is, uh, well, we think that there was actually a, a, a significant growth during that period, during those uh, 500 years. Slow it was, but uh, cumulatively, it did make a difference. And the, for, you said that the, the, Greece, the Greeks did not want the government to use record for what reason again? Because for a few seconds, you chipped out. So just repeat that part. Right, the, uh, keeping records about what you're doing uh, may implies that someone will have information which potentially can be used against you. All right. And <laughs> as simple it, as that for the ancient Greeks. So the less it was available to the authorities, the better off they were. And in your paper, you also explore the role of institutions. How did Greek institutions enable in innovation? Uh, it, is, it is the case. Uh, that uh, the, uh, there was actually a, a lot of innovation in ancient Greece during that time, and uh, innovation which took a form of new organizations, political organizations, and innovation, some actually technological innovation. The technological innovation, however, did not bring actually much uh, benefits into manufacturing. Uh, uh, the, let me put it like that. The Greeks, to begin with, bequeathed us uh, the alphabet, the phonetic alphabet which was a clear difference from what it was until then. Uh, if you compare it, to put it in, in, in modern terms, uh, we use an alphabet with, well, how many symbols, letters, right? And compare that with a Chinese, uh, actually, script, how many uh, 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 symbols, letters, ideograms. When we, we compare something like, all that you need for the Latin alphabet is 26 uh, uh, letters, and you, you, you can actually call yourself that you have a, 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 a an ability to communicate in written Chinese. You need to, to know at least 500 ideograms. Well, it's a big difference. So a big innovation was to make communication easier by the phonetic alphabet. I hasten to add, it was not actually purely Greek invention. What the Greeks did was uh, to take the Phoenician alphabet and in a way, tinker a little bit with it. And eventually, they bequeathed us the alphabet of which even the Latin alphabet is based in the Cyrillic one and so on. So that was a big innovation. Obviously, that implies that now you can have a written record of contracts. You can have a written record of some accounts, which you did. So the organization of transaction uh, became a lot cheaper. 
in comparison to what it was before, in comparison to what you could see in Egypt, let's say, uh, or in the Mesopotamia and so on. But uh, having a, a, a new script does not necessarily imply that your industrial productivity increases. In interesting. George, in ancient Greece, did the were, were the farmers commercial? Did they have a commercially oriented mentality? What a good question, Lipton. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a, we can spend actually uh, hours, days, months, if not a lifetime on that. Uh, the, uh, it, it, it appears that uh, the, the, the largest number of uh, farmers uh, were actually uh, striving for self-sufficiency with differentiation, meaning that uh, uh, due to the vagaries of the weather and the like, and the threat of starvation for a family, and you didn't even know how long, your, how big your family was going to be, and for how long it was going to stay dependent on you. They diversified their crops, uh, and they were striving for self-sufficiency. Now, from the uh, record uh, the, that uh, we have, uh, the uh, richest of those uh, ancient Greek city-state Athens was not self-sufficient in grain. It had to import grain, and it did import grain from Egypt as well as from the Black Sea. Uh, now, did the farmers have actually a commercial, a commercial uh, attitude towards it? The, there are two broad theories regarding actually economic, uh, economic um, uh, activity in ancient Greece, or the nature of the economy. One of them, uh, which is known as the primitive substantive, substantive uh, theory, says that, um, no, not really. They were only interested in self-sufficiency and nothing else. No market uh, orientation, no commercial interests and the like. Of course, there is the opposite view, the so-called modernization or formalism idea of the ancient economy, which says, may be true that for smallholders, uh, uh, self-sufficiency was the ideal, but there were actually a number of um, uh, larger landowners who were basically commercial entrepreneurs. So they were trying actually to maximize their services. They were trying actually to maximize profits from um, agriculture. Contrary to the primitive view, farmers ran their business with the aim of improving yields and profits. And far from being consumer or parasite cities, city states were undoubtedly manufacturing sites. So you were citing the research of Harris and Lewis and Brisson who, who argue and that in it. ancient Greece, farmers were commercially oriented. Yes. And there's also an, another compelling point, George. Did ancient Greece record economic transitions? So, for instance, you write in this section of the piece, for example, Alco, Alcos and Kyriazis calculate that in Athens, the combined shares of the manufacturing and service sectors in employment and output exceeded that of agriculture. This is indicative of a modern economy. When modern economies become more prosperous, agriculture declines in importance. That is true. That is correct. Uh, that is actually the, the so-called classical Athens era, the century, the fifth century BC and the and the uh, fourth century BC uh, were such that uh, we've got more information and they allow this kind of um, uh, well, guess estimates that um, indeed uh, the economy was closer to uh, a kind of an industrialized, um, even at a small scale, even with uh, uh, actually simpler technologies than the purely uh, agrarian economy. So George, am I Finley? Is he incorrect? Was he wrong about the ancient economy? Uh, uh, he was correct in some parts, but not fully correct. Finley was not right in everything that he said. No, he was not. He did, uh, he did actually alert us to a number of, um, of issues of importance, but um, uh, he, he was not he was not handed right percent. He was not actually hundred percent right. No. Was the Greek economy embedded in status for those who are not familiar with the ideas of Finlay. This was one of his main points. Right. Okay. And um, again, a very uh, excellent question. Was the Greek economy embedded? Uh, so Finlay says that the economy was embedded in uh, politics and religion. 
Uh, as an economist uh, myself, I would actually, Tim is not alive, has been dead for a long time, but I would, if I had met him, uh, uh, I would have reversed the question and I would say, was it religion and politics embedded in the economy? <laughs> uh, what I'm trying to say here is that, um, yes, of course, uh, it was embedded, but all economies are embedded. Uh, our modern capitalist economy is embedded. The communist economy of the Soviet era was embedded. Uh, the feudal economy of the medieval times was embedded, full stop. All economies are embedded in this respect. We cannot run the economy without actually some idea, some kind of principle, some kind of values. Uh, things change and you may become a lot more tolerant uh, or intolerant as, as things go by. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and, and if I were to model it as an economist, I would have a utility function, which has got a number of attributes. An attribute is purely monetary incentives. Another attribute would be, let's say my friendship. Right? I would like to have friends. Or another one would be my attitude, let's say, against women, for example. You know, that could have been thought as all right some time ago. Yes, okay, men are superior to women. To give you a better example, actually, from modern era, um, uh, the, uh, uh, when I was a small boy, um, um, adultery was a criminal offense. And now we're laughing at it. We're in Greece? So, yes, yes. <laughs> It was a criminal offense in some yes. part of the United States. In Greece, it was actually, a, adultery was, of course, a cause of divorce, and it was a criminal offense, no longer. So, uh, yes, everything is embedded, right? Everything is embedded, and everything at the same time can be disembedded, depending on the, the values and attitudes and principles, and you learn from others, and you learn from experience. Again, I can put another, give you another example here. Uh, uh, is homosexuality a criminal act? Of course it was a criminal act a few years back, not anymore. Now, if anything, the idea is, uh, uh, will, will the church, or actually various Christian churches, accept it as equal? Wedding ceremonies and so on. You see how it has actually, how the debate has moved over, over something like a span of, I don't know, 50 or 40 years. So yes, everything is embedded and everything is disembedded. You, you may disembed it. All right, let me share some data with the audience to detail economic progress in classical Greece. And you write, most remarkably, most remarkably real per capita consumption rose by an annual rate of 0.18%, greater than the 0.10% of the early Roman Empire, 30 BCE to 284 CE, and not far off from the 0.20% of 1580 to 1820 pre-industrial Holland. And this data is from jo Josiah Ober. So, Yes. The evidence is quite compelling. Ancient, ancient Gr Greece, for a period of time, prospered. Yes. Yes. George, so earlier we were establishing that farmers in ancient Greece were commercially oriented, but this paper also referred to, to attitudes to work in ancient Greece. How did people view work? Was it a work-oriented society? Was work viewed as arduous? Was it dignified? Uh, uh, that's a very good question again. Um, the, uh, to begin with, what we know about attitudes towards uh, work come from uh, the writings of philosophers and orators at courts and the like. And these were people of, from the upper classes, right? So. Uh, there is one question here. Do they writings represent what the common people, right, the ordinary actually citizen uh, who was striving to make a living and better uh, the, the, the family fortunes, uh, do they share, did they share the same values? That's, that's one thing. I mean, if you look at it, it's always the case. Do the elites and the common people share the same values on everything and anything? The elites were sufficiently rich not to have to work. Indeed. That was the definition of a, uh, of a rich person uh, and, uh, uh, and negatively the definition of a poor person. A poor person was not necessarily someone who was starving. A poor person was someone who had to work for actually uh, securing uh, the living standard of um, basically thinking of the head of the household of his family rather than her family, even though we know widows and so on and so forth. But let's put it like that. 
So the, uh, 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 if I had to work, if I had actually to go to my um, farm, or if I had actually to see the work done in the um, workshop, the metal workshop and so on, I, I am not an elite person and probably some members of the elite despise me for that. So taking that into account, what were the attitudes? Uh, the attitudes were that um, uh, as far as the people who had to work uh, were concerned, they did not mind working. They were taking pride in their work. And we know that uh, primarily from the various actually festivals which were celebrating the goddess Athene as a goddess of work, a goddess actually which uh, is protecting all those people who work. So, so we can put those things, we can juxtapose, if you like, the elite attitudes and the non-elite attitudes. Staying with the elites, staying with the elites, uh, the, uh, uh, and, and, and the elite is actually thinking of higher values. High, higher values in this respect means, uh, how can I better my city-state? How can I advance the interests of the city-state? So they get involved in politics. Now, can the common people get involved in politics? What the Athenians did was that they recognized that taking part in politics, going to the assembly to vote, or actually uh, 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 occupying public office, meant that, that you could. So, in order to compensate you for that, when you do any kind of this kind, any kind of political work, political activity, you are actually getting a fee. A fee for service. George, you were speaking and you said meant that. Could you repeat that statement, please, for a minute you chipped out? Um, sorry, which, which statement about the no, fee? Yes, you were saying it, in order to enter politics meant that, and you started to talk about politics and the fee. So just repeat that in statement. Order, in, order to, in order to participate in politics, you need time, obviously, because yeah. think of an environment uh, where Think of ancient Athens. Think of an environment where uh, you, you, you walk to the city center where there is political activity, or at best, you can actually ride a donkey. Right? You don't, it, it takes time and uh, to, to get from where you are, from where your farm is, to the center of political activity. And um, therefore, takes time means that you may waste a day, more than a day, that um, otherwise you, you, would, you would, would have occupied farmers' work. In order to facilitate political activity and give an equal opportunity to all Athenian citizens, and I'm talking about men this time again, uh, to participate in politics, either to vote in the assembly or to occupy public office and so on, the state had legislated to pay a fee for political activity. The fee is approximately the average daily wage. Do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Right. So, so the point is really that uh, by taking part in politics, you are not going to, to perish. You are not going to neglect. Uh, you, you will be, you, you are compensated. You will be able actually to make up for the lost earnings otherwise. All right. So, George, should we dismiss the view that the Asian Greeks had an aristocratic mindset that denigrated work and preferred honor. This is a popular uh, thesis that the uh, ancient Greece cared more about the military than work. Um, I, I do not subscribe to that. Yeah, it, it, it's evident from your article. But there's an, another part of the puzzle. In your article, you also note that the ancient Greeks preferred self-employment. They did not like to work for yeah. other people. That and that, is, yeah. yes. Tell us a little that about this story. That's a different issue. Yes, that is a different thing. That um, uh, the uh, common people despised, well, despised, uh, uh, were actually uh, against working in the employee of someone else. They did not mind contracting work. Uh, they did not mind uh, if actually they were working for someone else for a number of days to do a job, but they were not actually happy to work as employees. It was it was thought as a sign of servitude. It was thought as a sign of more or less slavery. Uh, and that was, a, in my view anyway, an important impediment to economic growth because you do not establish actually business-like um, 
a specialization and then in the skills that if you do not if you do not become uh, attached to a job for a significant period of time uh, so that you learn by doing and you you advance actually a, uh, your own productivity in that job exactly so you could have me for example helping you out for three days in uh, uh, when you harvest your olives right but i wouldn't like to be i don't want to be your farm worker you i would actually i would i would be happy to for example um um uh, manufacture right? uh, 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 prepare a um uh, uh, an armory for you um, a shield and uh, and a spare and the like but i don't want actually you to be the factory owner and me working as an employee there all right and as you said this negatively affected human capital formation yes because when you are employed for someone you are given an opportunity to acquire new skills. You, are, you, you do not specialize in your job. And this, it, this, so for example, this year, I may help you with um, uh, harvesting your olives, and then you are gonna help me harvesting grapes. Next year, it's not gonna be you, it's gonna be your neighbor or your, I don't know, your cousin who is helping me with the olives. And I'm not gonna help you with uh, grapes at all. Probably I will bring some, uh, some milk from the new goats that I have to you, things like this. So you do not specialize. You lose this kind of specialization. You lose the ability actually to learn and uh, uh, by, well, basically repeating the work and saying what works better, what can increase my productivity and so on. This is lost. Was... It's like, like saying, you know, uh, uh, jack of all trades is master of none. <laughs> okay, then. Did the trade contribute to economic growth in Greece? And... I'm sorry, Livan, I think I lost you. Did no, what? That, the trade, open trade. Yes. Yes, from what we understand, uh, the, uh, there was a, uh, it was a global economy. It was a, a, a case of globaliza early globalization. Uh, globalization, of course, not in the, in the form that uh, we understand it or we know it today, but um, um, if we think that um, um, the about a third of, um, of ancient Greeks lived in urban areas, in city centers, and, um, and uh, about a quarter or between a quarter and a third of the Greeks um, uh, uh, imported their the food, then obviously uh, uh, trade was very important to them and, um, and it, was a, a, uh, uh, it was a driving force uh, for, for economic uh, activity and prosperity. Our it, it, it is confirming another long run assumption that institutional quality affect, affects economic growth. I actually have a piece on the topic for the Mises Institute where I examine economic freedom and institutional quality in ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. the, the yes. Greek, it, it appears that the ancient Greeks did better in a time of economic freedom and openness to trade. Uh, they did well. We did better, probably. Well, don't very difficult to say. Bet, better in comparison to what? In comparison to the Romans. Uh, after the Roman Empire uh, actually established its uh, Pax Romana, the Roman peace of the uh, second century uh, uh, um, uh, uh, BC. I mean, um, uh, CE. I'm sorry, uh, Common Era. Uh, then. Uh, 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 there was also there were extended trade networks there too, uh, but I, I'm afraid I cannot make the comparisons. I don't know enough about about the Romans. George, there is also another parallel between ancient Greek growth and modern growth: the role of political fragmentation. Is this important? Uh, yes. Uh, it um, it by ancient Greece count something like a, a thousand, uh, uh, 1,100 more, more different uh, independent city-states. Uh, that immediately shows uh, in a kind of a rather uh, restricted geographical area, there was um, a lot of variety. Variety is good on the one side. On the other hand, 
all those places as uh, independent units were small and they could never develop economies of scale in their manufacturing, in their agriculture, in their trading, the economies of scale were missing. And as we always teach our students in uh, microeconomics and economic history, uh, industrial revolution meant, first of all, economies of scale. The unit cost of production increases tremendously as I increase the scale of production, as I produce more and more units. So everything becomes cheaper and affordable. That was not the case. Ancient Greece could not achieve that. But in, in your article, there is, a, uh, there is an interesting point, and I'm going to share it with the audience. Unlike the Eastern empires or Rome, the Greek city-states did not consolidate into a single centralized state. They developed a variety of governance structures from democratic Athens to oligarchic Sparta and included aristocratic current and the kingdom of Macedon. Again, it is frequently averred that the inability of, of Europe to, to create a new centralized empire facilitated the easy flow of ideas. Empires are concerned with stability, not necessarily innovations. So they tend to block, to block change. And we're also observing this for ancient Greece. Yes, I stand by that. The, uh, uh, the, the ideas that we talk about here are different, different thing from uh, how far a, a unified area can actually promote economic growth because of economies of scale. George, do you have a book in the process on this uh, topic? No, I don't, I'm afraid. Why? Or not, let me put it, not yet. Okay, let not yet. Um, I, 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 I look at ancient Greece and um, uh, uh, at the economics of ancient Greece and at the politics of ancient Greece and I, I favor an integrated approach, integrated approach, which is uh, basically uh, think as an economist, everybody's trying to maximize the benefit, be it in political activity, be it in economics and so on. What do you get out of it? And that has, uh, uh, that has actually yielded a number of papers, which have, if you like, a unifying way of thinking about it, but they're not a book. They're actually bits and pieces. When I sit down and put them together, then they're going to be a, a book. Yeah, I, I think that this will be a, a great book. So we're going to digress a bit to talk about property rights. Were property rights instrumental in facilitating economic growth in ancient Greece? Yes. And, um, and uh, uh, we, we know that uh, from the work of, um, uh, well, from the works of uh, a number of Greek poets, make us understand that property rights were well defined, protected, and when disputed, uh, we could go all the way to the court uh, and you would expect neutral and unbiased uh, judgments. So yes, property rights were well protected and um, uh, that was significant for um, the process of growth. It's one of the most significant economic institutions to know who owns what and what exactly are the benefits and obligations from ownership. Quoting Bit Rose and Kara Yanis, you write, it, they attribute the success of Athens to an environment where the state guaranteed that property rights would not be expropriated and in turn, individuals exercise responsibility in their pursuits by balancing their own interests with those of the community in which they lived. On the contrary, Sparta, with an oligarchic government and lacking clear definition and protection of private property, discouraged both political and economic innovation. Not only that, uh, in Sparta, it, um, it um, it was actually frowned upon to own money in the local currency, as far as we know, was not silver as it was in Athens, not gold, but um, uh, uh, bits of iron, uh, heavy pieces that you would not carry around actually easily. 
Uh, so Sparta was different. Sparta was oligarchic and Sparta was based on something which, uh, the economy, I mean, was based on something which they would call actually serfdom economy. And uh, uh, political rights were restricted to a very small number of men. The yeah. so-called similar ones. Uh, uh, unlike, unlike Athens, which uh, did not have this kind of hang-ups for a variety of reasons, uh, the uh, well, the, the Athenians established uh, uh, an inclusive democracy, inclusive for men only. I repeat, for men only, inclusive in the sense that it didn't matter how much wealth you had, how much money you had, provided you were an Athenian citizen, you had actually full political rights. And what's also quite captivating about your article is that you inform us that in ancient Greece limitations were actually imposed on political rule. And again, I'm going to read because I like to share evidence so that our listeners can do further research. Examining the social norms and legal provisions in forensic speeches, Karayanis and Atzis write, fourth century Athenian laws were mainly geared towards the enforcement of contracts and the limitation to the arbitrary economic and political power held by the elites. They offered the institutional framework that was conducive to the economic and social development of Athens. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the theory of economic growth, which emphasizes the importance of institutions, pays a lot of attention to property rights. In other words, I know what is mine, and I know, and I have actual confidence that um, it will be mine for a long time to come, and then I can pass it on to whoever I decide, typically my descendants, typically my children. Uh, so I'm not worried about uh, the state, the, the ruler, the prince, whatever you want to call it, uh, expropriating my property. Uh, uh, unless of course there are reasons which are set up in the law, unless I do something which is criminal, unless I am actually uh, am condemned for, for prison and so on. So uh, that, gives me, that gives me a long-term horizon. I can plan uh, on uh, improvements for my, my property, my capital, my land, whatever it is, and that will eventually increase the yield, increase the return and therefore economic growth. Exactly, and the Athenians and... Were, were like that. The Athenians actually did uh, did big on that point. Uh, it went uh, in hand with democracy. You have uh, you have actually a, a uh, the odds are that you will have a better protection of um, property rights in a democratic environment rather than an environment which is uh, oligarchic or dictatorial. The dictator can do as he she likes. Uh, the democrat cannot. The democrat will have to face. Uh, 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 the, the people and is accountable actually to a variety of routes, elections, courts, uh, public opinion, and so on. Exactly. And long-term orientation is associated with entrepreneurship and economic growth. Predictab predictability is important for the market. Yes. The paper I mentioned earlier is this paper by Berg and Lit Litkens. Litkens. I read it. Yes. Examine they examine the quality of the of the economic institutions of Athens in the 340s yes. by applying the economic freedom index. And the Asian Greeks were quite impressive. Athens yes. scores an impressive 8.8 .8 out of 10 in the 2013 International League, second to Hong Kong, with a score yes. of 9.02, while modern yes. Greece would scored only 6.87 and was in the 68 position position yes you wonder what happened yes <laughs> yes yeah, so the, the the asian the studying asian Gr greece confirms many modern assumptions about economic growth like i said earlier institutional quality economic freedom the role of political fragmentation and institutional innovations yes a, a brilliant case study. But the, the, the ancient Greek, Greeks were so smart and innovative. So why then did growth peter out? That, is, that was actually the, the, the main focus of my paper. Uh, I'll put it in, if you want me to put it in one word, then I would say that the, 
a basic unit of organization, political organization, the city state reached its limits. And therefore, after that, they were diminishing returns. And um, its limits were political, military, as well as economic. It, and as a result, it could not withstand the pressure from uh, the bigger powers, the uh, very strong, actually, monarchies, uh, first of Macedon uh, and then of Rome. So it had reached its physical limitations. It was, uh, it was too small on the one side. Uh, second, it could not actually develop uh, a professional military class in the way that Macedon and uh, Rome did. Uh, third, it implied that in order to keep the internal peace, uh, the uh, internal peace meaning uh, to avoid social strife between uh, different economic interests and so on and so forth, uh, uh, it, um, it worked, it, um, it, it put a kind of an upper limit into how much uh, innovative and therefore disruptive uh, economic growth could occur. I am agreeing with with you, with you George, but I I read your article in its entirety and you list a, a number of factors. And before we get to them, I want you to speak briefly about energy. Yes. Yes. Uh, this uh, this is something which um, uh, most of uh, modern historians who look at um, uh, the growth of ancient Greece, um, the, uh, ignore. It's an issue that they ignore. Uh, what I'm, I'm trying to do here is the following thing, is to say, if I look at the Industrial Revolution and why the Industrial Revolution started from Britain, uh, there is something that modern historians, probably with the exception of Alain Bresson, have actually missed, and that is the cost of energy. Energy was extremely costly in ancient Greece. And that means that uh, manufacturing starts from a disadvantage. If manufacturing is associated with metal works, then you need a lot of energy. You need a lot of heat, basically. And you need a lot of heat because somehow, as we learned nowadays from, uh, from 300 years ago or so, a lot of uh, modern industrial uh, technology is based on steel and you need a lot of heat to produce steel. Now, the ancient Greeks would not do that. To put it yet another way, they had conceived of, the, um, uh, of something which was is equivalent to the um, uh, steam engine, but they could not put the steam engine into any kind of production. Why? Because the thing was unstable. They did not have, put it this way, they did not have steel rods or, um, uh, uh, still nails or anything like that to put it down and stay where it was supposed to stay to do the work. So it was more like a toy like, rather than anything else. But in terms of ability to understand, conceive uh, what void means, what is actually uh, the power of um, uh, compressed air and so on, they were there. But they could not translate uh, that into a practical engine, the practical uh, mechanism that could be exploited for manufacturing reasons. So energy was very expensive. The sources of energy were obviously human energy, right? You need people to row the, sh the ships. Obviously wind, again, you need good wind for sailing and uh, energy from um, animals, horses and oxen, especially oxen uh, for plowing and so on. And um, uh, when you want to generate heat, they mainly generated heat from wood, right? Charcoal, which is very expensive. Not only takes a long time to, for the forest that um, um, you cut down to regrow, uh, you actually lose a lot of, um, a lot of wood uh, in the preparation of charcoal. So it was very, very expensive. If energy is expensive, transport is very expensive. If transport is very expensive, then you are bound to stay within localities. You cannot have very extensive uh, network where you can uh, you can actually move uh, goods cheaply and uh, and um, uh, relatively speaking fast. So the economy is condemned to stay rather simple, agrarian, if you like. George... Britain was different in this respect. Britain was different because Britain simply was standing on a lot of untapped coal. Coal was actually cheap. 
Yeah, yes, coal, coal was cheap, but some, some argue that the British created transportation infrastructure to reduce the, the cost of transporting coal. So that, that, that advantage was more related to British institutions in the transportation sector than the possession of coal. Can you see the similarities here? So did the Greeks. They did have the institutions. They did have the networks. They knew actually how to go from place A to B. But in order to move from uh, the Piraeus, the Athenian port, to the Black Sea, they needed something like five days on the way up. And if I remember correctly, a week to two weeks on the way down because of different currents and winds. So they had established the institutions, uh, property rights. They had established the networks but they could not do it fast and cheaply. Reasonably, the, the cost was simply too prohibitive. This is the distinction between the, the British and the Greece. Yes. Coal was an advantage in England, but institutions made it superb. And the institutions yes. could have benefited coal because it was not as expensive as in Greece. This is what you're yes. saying. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes. Now, we're, now we're going to talk about the corporation in ancient Greece. You posit that the inability of the legal system to recognize businesses as autonomous entities for juridical purposes impeded a sustained industrial revolution. Yes, what, that, what they're saying here is really that um, uh, the, the Greeks had no notion that they can be a legal entity which is independent of the persons who are part as employers or as owners of that legal entity. Either you and I do business or we don't do business. It, does not, it did not make sense for them for, let's say, you to set up an enterprise and uh, me setting up another enterprise and the two enterprises doing business independently of us, independently of who we are. So, Equally, it could have been you know, your family instead of you and my family instead of me or with me as well. That it was, it was in this respect, a personal relationship. The corporation should have limited liability. If the, if the corporation died with the founder, this adversely affects capital formation. It doesn't in promote yes. long-term growth. In a way, yes. Yes. Put it right like that, yes. Even though the... Uh, well, look, my, my son would start a new one. It's not as such a continuation. My son can actually inherit uh, and start, but he starts his new, his new corporation, his new actually uh, 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 ecos, oikos, as it was called in Greece. Uh, so, uh, so we, I mean, if, if think, about, think about the, uh, the big industrial corporations of our era. How old are they? They go back to the end of the 19th century. Some of them still survive, right? Some of the car manufacturers, right, still survive. I mean, Mercedes, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bench started, I think, in 1890, 1890 something. And if you look at the at other actually big, big, big corporations, they started well uh, in the 20s, 1920s, I mean, and uh, the 1940s. I mean, look at some of the uh, colossal actually firms of today, right? Uh, think of. Uh, Facebook, think of Google, and so on and so forth. They are only a few years old. So we've got to go back to uh, the petroleum industry. We find some big corporations. Well, they go back to what? To when the economy moved away from coal, the international economy moved away from coal and towards petrol. Think of the uh, uh, electric goods companies. Again, they go back to uh, the uh, late 19th, early 20th century. Consumer goods companies, the white, the white goods companies, anything from... Um, um, washing machines to electric cookers and so on. So uh, these uh, uh, these companies are very much uh, a uh, something which we developed after the industrial revolution. The idea of limited liability and so on and so forth did exist beforehand. In uh, but, but you see how how far away is modern era in this respect to the, the company the, as a legal personality uh, in comparison to ancient Greece. That, that idea as a legal personality did not exist. George, and you also discuss the anti-development cultural trait of reciprocal assistance between citizens in the sense of 
the gift exchange what do you mean explain it for our, is, for our audience that is actually that is a uh, that is a a view held by substantialist economists those economists who actually uh, argued that the economy was embedded so uh, they the point there was the following uh, i am in need of cash and uh, i will go to my friends uh, to raise the the loan and the, my friends will not actually charge me an interest rate, a commercial rate for that. They will help me out uh, and I will pay when I can. And in exchange, when a friend of mine from this group also needs some cash, I will help out and other people will help out and so on. So this is actually what, um, what the, uh, instead of uh, going to a bank, instead of actually making uh, borrowing in commercial terms, it was a kind of a friendly association which is an obviously anti-capitalist. It doesn't work for the advance of, of capitalism. You do not actually seek any profit uh, out of this, of the use of money and so on. Uh, so that is one view uh, uh, of, the, of, the ancient, uh, of the ancient economy. Uh, while uh, uh, various other um, uh, historians will argue on the opposite. They will say that yes, that existed, and it may even exist nowadays when you need some money and you can turn to your family for some help, a temporary loan. But at the same time, we also have evidence of commercial loans, especially to finance uh, seed trade and uh, various other uh, uh, business activities. And uh, we know that interest rates, we've got actually evidence of interest rates, anything from 8% to, believe it or not, 30%, and sometimes even 50%. Alain Bresson is very... Uh, very uh, uh, vocal on that. Uh, yeah, I, I'll, lay, I'll lay another new book. I need to buy it. It's, um, it's a good book. I quite like it. And Alain is a very nice person to talk to. Yes, <laughs> I should send him an email. I wonder why I wasn't thinking about that. I'm going to send him an email. So yeah, he's, a, he's a good guy, Alain. Yeah, he's, now, he's French. He's now based in Chicago. He's a French, uh, actually, economist. And he's based in Chicago in those days. Yeah, I like the Stanford, e the Stanford economists like Josiah Oberon, Alain, and Walter. They have been doing some really brilliant work. Yes, yes. Josiah Oberon is also is a, yes. a brilliant mind. Yes. I don't know, have you talked to him or? No, I haven't he's spoken already... to him as yet, but I've read his articles on, on, on Greece. Yeah, he's, he's also extremely open-minded. All right, so he I was... never dismiss any idea. He will take it at face value. If the idea is stupid, I would say. He's very polite. He's, he's a very good man, Josiah. Yeah, you, you're, 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 you're a PR expert today, George. I'm sorry. No, I, said, I, lost you. No, I you... said you are a PR expert today because, <laughs> of how, yeah, because of how you're promoting your colleagues. You know, George, so I like academic humility. Some academics, George, are not friendly to their colleagues. <laughs> Uh, you know, you know, a few years back, oh, I, I, I don't know what is um, your, um, your, uh, your political memory in this respect and how far you've come across the name of Henry Kissinger. Yes, Henry, you know, yes. Yes, you know, okay. Uh, after, after actually his um, uh, stint at the um, uh, State Department, he went to, he was invited to the, um, at, at Harvard, to the, um, Kennedy School of Government, of Government in Harvard, and um, he was actually taking part there. He gave some lectures and he was uh, participating in various administrative councils and the like. And once an academic asked him uh, why he thought that um, uh, academics are so vicious to each other, <laughs> and Kissinger actually, or well, legend has it, thought a little bit and said, "Oh, I know why. Uh, why?" Because the stakes are too low. Yes, I know the story. Yeah, <laughs> oh, you know I know the story. The story. Right? Yes, I know the story. So, so it's a it's a permanent indictment against actually academics in general, not just economists. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, we're, so we're wrapping up now. But before we do so, we're going to talk about collectivism. Was collectivism a barrier to long-term economic growth in ancient Greece? You uh, seem to share this idea. Yes, I I I think it was. I think it was in so far as uh, your rights are actually rights because you are a member of the collectivity instead of uh, you being a human born into this world, that is an impediment to growth. Uh, the, the, it's sort of public 
uh, opinion, meaning sometimes popularity, other times outcry against what you're doing and so on, uh, may trump up your personality. And uh, that actually will work against you innovating, against you trying actually to break uh, off the mold and so on. Yeah, collectivistic cultures are embedded, not autonomous. So people are unlikely to deviate from the norm. And when, you, when we deviate from the norm, we often innovate. That, that is correct. Yeah, Ger is correct. Gerard yes. Roland was a guest on this show some time ago. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I thought it's a very good paper. On that one. Yeah, Gerard has done several papers. He did a paper on democracy and individualism, and he has a paper on the deep roots of development, surveying yes. the link between Asian institutions and modern practices. Yes. yes. So Gerard has several papers, and there's a paper yes. by a, an economist. He's Dutch. His name is Andre on the deep roots of human capital, Andre Van Horn. I don't speak Dutch, so maybe I'm mispronouncing his name, but it's H O O R N. Oh, yes, I think, yes, 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 I'm yes I'm yeah, Andre, Andre yes. Van Horn. Yes. Before yes. And again, before we go, George, I must say, I also read your paper on religion in Greece, but we're not going to discuss it today, but I read it <laughs> and it, it, it was quite enthralling. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. You're very kind. You're very kind. Thank you. No, well, um, I, I, I'm not being kind. I'm being objective. I don't give away compliments easily. People have to earn them. Well, <laughs> all right. I, I, if, if, I don't know where it shows, but I'm blushing. <laughs> yeah, all right. But <laughs> yes, it was a pleasure speaking to you, George, but you unfortunately, I have to go. So bye, George. I am sorry about uh, the mistimings this morning, but um, I've, I've put it at three o'clock just to be on the safe side. We're done. Thank you very yeah. much for, for having me. Yeah, so all right. Bye. You. Yeah. Bye bye.